Thanks for tuning into Dirty Teeth and welcome back to the channel. I'm on my last big ride before packing things up and heading up to Alaska for the Iditarod. So I figured this would be a good time to make a video about my goals, my fears, and dig into the bike a little. What do you think? Let's go inside. By the time you're watching this video, all the hay will be in the barn, and I should be about 16-ish hours into my rookie adventure on the Iditarod Trail Invitational. This will be my first time on the route, and although I'm super excited, I'd be lying to you if I didn't tell you I was a little bit nervous. But hey, get busy living or get busy dying. By the way, if you're curious about following the race progress, you can track all of the riders at trackleaders.com. I'll put a specific link in the description below. Although I won't be checking any emails or text along the way, I could sure use your encouragement. So any comments you put down below, I look forward to reading and replying to as soon as I get back. Lord knows I can use all the well wishes I can get. Although it may seem a little weird, I want to take this moment to acknowledge my goals and fears of this deep winter expedition. Then I'll quickly take you through my bike setup and show you what I've done to make Sly, my Y Big Iron Fat Bike, expedition ready. I hope to get some footage at the race and make a couple more I Did A Rod videos when I get back. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, please make sure you're subscribed and have tapped the notification bell. Okay, my number one overarching goal is to finish the I Did A Rod plain and simple. To do this, I need to stay healthy and take care of myself. I definitely want to finish without causing any permanent damage to my body. No frost nip, no frostbite, no hypothermia. Beyond that, I hope not to just survive the effort, but actually thrive in the elements and relish immersing myself in the Alaskan wilderness. I want to travel with intention. I want to soak in my surroundings, glorify and honor my creator throughout the journey, and remain thankful and always in awe. Having this opportunity is both a blessing and a choice. I've been chasing after this goal for a long time, as has every participant. I want to keep all of that in mind as I'm struggling through the inevitable low spots. I'm looking forward to being forced beyond my comfort zone and pushing my own boundaries. I want to make impacting memories. I want to have positive and motivating interactions with other participants, as well as all of the selfless volunteers and locals I meet along the way. But beyond all that, there's still definitely a healthy dose of fear. The temps during the race are likely to be colder than anything I've ever encountered, both during my training and in life in general. I'm hoping my gear selection will have me covered, but it's hard to have complete confidence until I just go out there and do it. Like Mike Tyson said, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face. So yeah, I'm nervous about the cold and the wind, and sweating too much, or having a mechanical at the worst possible time, having gut issues, not being able to keep food or water down, yeah. I'm also concerned about open water and overflow on the rivers and lakes, as well as riding on glare ice and just busting through the ice and getting myself soaked. The list of potential hazards and pitfalls goes on and on. But I am confident in my skill set, my prep, my fitness, and most importantly, my mindset. I'll be heading to the start line having done my best to set myself up for success. I'm focusing on everything I can control and doing my darnest to brush off everything outside of my realm. So with all that drama and accountability out on the table, let's downshift and geek out on my bike setup. I reserve the right to tweak a couple small things at the last second, but for now, here we go. My riding partner is Sylvester. He's a titanium big iron made by Y Cycles in Colorado. Some of you may remember a couple videos I did detailing all the tech and build specs of Sly. Today I'm only going to focus on expedition changes and upgrades, as well as bags and storage I'll be using to carry all my excess luggage along the Iditarod. FYI, I keep all the details and specs of all my bikes on my blog, so I'll put a link down below. Many folks get specific wheels for ITI, and I was considering building up some special wheels myself. For many, 26 inch wheels with 100 millimeter rims and the fattest tires you can get are the ideal setup for ITI. This gives you maximum flotation on potentially super soft and sloppy Iditarod conditions. After much internal debate and riding on all kinds of variable terrain, I chose to stick with my stock head wheels. In the end, I didn't feel it was worth dropping all the extra cash for some new wheels. And I definitely feel there's some merit to the longer contact patch of the 27.5 wheels, even though they're not quite as wide. I've taken rides with friends using 100 millimeter rims on five inch tires. These are folks way more skilled than me. Even in the softest conditions, I've never encountered a scenario where I'm stuck pushing while they're riding away from me. If I'm pushing, they are too. That said, I'll let you know after ITI if I'm still standing by this choice. We'll see. But I did swap out my tires and I'll be using 45 North Dillinger 5s. The 5 in the name is kind of confusing and it's easy to assume they're 5 inch tires. 
but the 26 inch version is actually 4.6 and my 27.5s are actually 4.5. Go figure. My Bontrager narwhals were too beefy and aggressive and heavy for what I think I'll need on the ITI. Dillingers have long been the go-to for many ITI riders. They offer a good blend of traction and volume with low rolling resistance and the opportunity to add studs. Being studdable is important to me because of the high probability of riding over frozen lakes on glare ice during the ITI. I've never used studs before, so I chatted with my buddy Derek, who's got tons of studding experience. What a stud. On the rear wheel, I installed 42 studs zigzagging across the middle. This is what Derek calls a safety pattern. Not enough to make a noticeable difference in weight, but enough to add traction when you need it. I did the same thing in the front, but also added studs to every fourth cornering knob. I chose this for a little bit more protection since it's your front wheel that can typically turn and slip out easier in ice. If you're curious, I use the 45 North Carbide XL studs, which are the most aggressive. I also dip them in isopropyl alcohol during installation to make them easier to see. The 98 studs I used on the front tire added 39 grams, and the 42 studs I used in the rear added a mere 18 grams. And if the studs save me from even one fall, they're worth their weight in gold. For sealant, I'm using a half-half blend of Orange Seal Regular and Sub-Zero. In my experience, the regular seals the best, but dries up the easiest. The higher concentration of antifreeze in the Sub-Zero makes it better in colder temps, but it doesn't seal as well. So I just mix the two and try to get the best of both worlds. I swapped out my valve stem nuts for Problem Solver's Super Peanuts and put on some ODI rubber valve stem covers. The oversized peanuts are much easier to tighten with gloves. And the rubber valve covers protect the valve cores from getting iced up in snowy conditions. Which is especially important with how much we're constantly airing our tires up and down. They pull off and on easy, and they're big and colorful, so they're hard to lose in the snow. Moving along to the handlebars and cockpit area. I mentioned swapping to the Monet light bars in my favorite upgrades of 2022 video, and I'm still loving them. The rise, sweep, and width make for comfy riding, and the BMX crossbar gives me a nice place to mount my Garmin. I also dangle a small burrito bag from there and mount my thermometer to one of the Velcro attachments. My handlebar light is mounted out of the way below the burrito bag. Speaking of the burrito bag, it's made by Rhino Walk, and I found it for 20 bucks on Amazon. In addition to the main pocket, it has an internal zippered pocket, which is great for stashing some cash or Advil or anything else. And there's a bungee cord in the front, in case I want to stash my goggles or wind jacket or something. You can never have too many storage options while bikepacking. This is all I keep up front so I can have a nimble front end for pushing through snow and getting flotation. I feel having most of the weight centered below my body or over the back wheel helps with traction. And I've got to say, so far during all my training, I'm really enjoying the clean cockpit. Attached to my bars are Dogwood Winter Pogies Plus, which I love for their simplicity. The Plus is the warmer model with more insulation than the regular version, but they're still very light and comfy. My hands and fingers are always cold and I worry about them a bunch. So I'll risk overheating for some peace of mind if the temps dip really low. I've gotten used to pulling my hands out of the pogies and riding with them on top if they start to sweat or need to cool down, so it's no big deal to me. The pogies snug up to the bars with bungee cords, but I added Velcro as well along the seams to seal the gap a little more and keep cold air from intruding. Underneath my pogies, I'm still using Wolf Tooth Mega Fat Paw silicone grips. But for even more cushion insulation, I've added a layer of 1 8 inch foam that I got from a Rockgeist Animalist sleeping pad a few years ago. Then I wrapped it all up with some tennis racket grip tape. I chose tennis racket tape because it's thin and stretchy and designed for sweaty bare hands. The finish on it also allows adhesive toe warmers to stick to it. And sometimes I like to slap these on my grips for a little bit of extra heat on my fingertips. I'm using Cane Creek Ergo bar ends that I drilled out and slid inboard about three quarters of an inch to accommodate my pogies. I tried another type that's a little bit lighter, but I prefer the soft rubber compound on these. I covered them with some extra padding as well and then wrapped it all up with electrical tape because I ran out of the tennis grip tape. I also wrapped all my metal controls and mounting hardware in electrical tape just for that little bit of extra insulation from the cold. My brake levers have silicone covers on them, and on top of that, I also added some insulated tubing for my hydration hose. I also keep my brake levers adjusted out a little further than I would normally. This keeps my pogies pushed away, giving my hands a little more room, and I can still reach my brakes just fine. Over by the left grip, I have the wireless control for my front light, which I'll detail more in an upcoming electronics video. I replaced my stock stem with a 40mm turquoise version from Industry 9 just to have a little fun and add some color. 
I also threw on one of my Make Trail Magic top caps to finish off the cockpit. Here's a shameless plug, both my top caps and carrying handle are available on my web store and all proceeds go to our Trail Magic initiatives. Moving on, I almost forgot below my top cap and stem, I installed a Rockgeist Space Link. It's hooked up to my new J-Pax Footlong EXT top tube bag. I love this mounting system. My bars turn silky smooth without Velcro binding up and making crunching sounds. And the bag itself is huge and has two compartments. The Big Iron's main triangle is pretty small, so for me, having a large gas tank is pretty necessary and I'm loving it. My saddle is a Brooks C13 carved with carbon rails. I also mentioned this in my favorites of 2022. It's the comfiest and most forgiving saddle I've ever owned while remaining light and durable. For Iditarod, I also made a couple tweaks to my drivetrain. I swapped out the 30 tooth round SRAM chain ring for a 26 tooth oval. I love oval chain rings on fat bikes, especially for the super slow granny gear climbs. I really feel they help me keep traction and smoother pedaling efficiency. After all, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. The ring is made by Alugear out of Poland. As of now, they're the only company I could find making oval rings in fat bike friendly sizes compatible with SRAM cranks. That means in either zero millimeter or negative four millimeter offsets. And they offer them in the standard three bolt configuration or eight bolt options for power meter cranks. The ring is high quality, up there with Absolute Black and Wolf Tooth, and they're currently flying under the radar here in the United States, so check them out. I've been training on a 1050 GX Eagle cassette, and when I swapped out the chain ring in the front, I also swapped to an XX1 Rainbow 1052 cassette in the back. This gives me six more teeth of granny gear for when I'm totally struggling with the loaded bike. I'm pretty sure I'll be stoked on that decision once I hit the trail in Alaska. To round out the drivetrain, I also threw on a brand new Exo Eagle chain. So those are pretty much all the changes I made to Sylvester himself. I already mentioned the burrito bag and the top tube bag, so now onto the rest of the bags and storage add-ons for the Alaskan wilderness. Over the rear wheel, I've installed a Carver Titanium Fat Rack. I was turned on to this rack by my friend Gino, who's riding a Carver fat bike, and I'm absolutely loving it. It's priced very fairly, especially for a titanium rack, even when compared to its aluminum and steel counterparts. It's light and strong, fits my bike like a glove, and offers a stable platform for my sleep system and my panniers. There's a spot for typical rack-mounted light brackets, which I sometimes use. But when my huge sleep roll is above it, it blocks the light. So for ITI, I'll just be hanging my rear light off of one of the side rails. On top of the Carver rack, I mount my sleep kit slash if something goes really sideways emergency clothing kit. The stuff sack itself is an Osprey medium pack liner. It's designed to keep the contents of their 50 to 70 liter backpacks dry and safe from rain and the elements. It fits my sleeping pad and all my gear nicely, and I don't have to smush my sleeping bag or bivy down too much. My friend Wade helped me customize it a little bit by sewing reflective ribbon strips on both sides. Just for giggles, I then seam sealed the area that was stitched through to keep the bag totally waterproof. The reflective strips add some visibility and offer me something to run my straps through when it's time to cinch it down. For attachment, I use regular 25 inch ski straps taped together and I use strap keepers so everything remains nice and tidy. I also added some bungee cord loops on top of the ski straps for an extra stash spot. This comes in handy for shedding layers or other lightweight items that I want to grab quickly throughout the day. Finally, I hang a reflective triangle off the back of the dry bag for more visibility from the rear. Hanging off the sides of the rack are Revelate Nano Panniers. They're lightweight and shaped well. I find they offer me just the right amount of useful storage without tempting me to overpack my fears. The compact design doesn't crimp my style when pushing the bike either. Some people customize them so they hang a little lower. This makes it easier to access the contents when you use a big sleep roll like I do. I may try doing this in the future, but for now, it doesn't bother me. And I didn't want to risk messing these up, since right now they're super hard to find, and I don't know when Revelate's going to make another batch. Next to the drive side pannier, I mounted a Sidero Devil's Kettle XL. It's the perfect unit for holding my thermos filled with hot tea. Some of you may wonder why I don't mount it to the handlebars, since that's what it's designed for. Well, I only sip from the thermos as a treat when I'm stopped. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm enjoying the clean and tidy cockpit. In the same spot on the non-drive side, I've attached a Nuclear Sunrise Giant Silo. This is basically an extra large feed bag, which I use for overflow. Sometimes it holds various bits of clothing, other times extra food and such. I'll say it again, you can never have enough storage space and I wasn't going to let this area go to waste. P.S. Neither the silo nor the devil's kettle strike my boots while pedaling or get in the way during hike-a-bike. 
Most bikes have some unused dead space between the rear rack and the seat post. Some folks even have custom bags made to fit this precious area. I discovered that a Revelate Shrew fills this void nicely on my bike. It's normally used as a small seat bag, but by mounting it vertically to my seat post, it fits securely and does the job. I keep some spare layers in there and can easily remove the whole bag and take it inside my sleeping bag or a checkpoint if I need to swap out some wet clothes. Luckily the down tube on my big iron has enough room to fit two storage vessels. I mount Nuclear Sunrise fuselage bags along the bottom. These bags come with burly Velcro mounting straps and they're typically designed for full squish bikes that are lacking lower brazons. But I'm just using the bags standalone and attaching them with some tail fin ski straps. One bag has my repair kit, spare tubes, extra batteries, and all that stuff so it's pretty heavy. I like keeping it low and centered near the bottom bracket. I park this one in a tail fin cargo cage for added stability and peace of mind. I make sure to strap it around the frame as well as through the cage for extra security. I use the second bag to house my fuel bottle, which is a bit lighter. So I just strap it directly to the frame and haven't had any issues with wiggle wobble. I'm comfy mounting both of these bags with just one ski strap each, but I purposely use two. These double as spare straps that I can take off and use in an emergency or for other occasions like wrapping them around my legs as part of my waterproof system in case I encounter open water. I'm maximizing my small main triangle storage with a custom bolt-on Rogue Panda frame bag. It has stretchy material below a burly zipper so I can confidently pack it to the gills within reason. I make sure all my important items are protected from the elements. But I also sprayed my frame bag, down tube bags, and shrew with Nikwax Solar Proof Waterproofer for added insurance. I figured it can't hurt since temps are always changing and heavy wet snow tends to stick around and melt in places you don't want it to. So that sums up my goals and worries as well as my bike setup that I'll be using to tackle the Iditarod Trail. For whatever it's worth, the bike weighs roughly 56 pounds fully loaded without food or water. If you enjoyed this video, please give us a like and share it. And if you have any questions, leave them down below in the comments. I look forward to addressing them when I get back. Thanks for hanging out till the end and wish me luck. Until next time, ride bikes, give back, pay it forward. Thanks so much for squeezing dirty teeth into your busy schedule. Please help us reach more people and ensure you receive new videos by giving this video a like, subscribing to the channel, and clicking the notification bell. Until next time, ride bikes, give back, pay it forward.